Rita, thank you so much for joining us and for your willingness to be our first person today. Um, we, as you know, we only have um, less than an hour now to cover an awful lot, so we'll, uh, we'll get started if that's, if that's okay. Sure. Although the Second World War began when Germany and the Soviet Union invaded Poland in September 1939, war didn't come directly to your community in Romania until 1940. Before we turn to the war years, to the Holocaust, and what it meant for you and your family, let's start first with you telling us a little bit about your very early years and about your family before war began. Sure. I came from a, a loving family. Um, my father was one of four. He was the only son. Um, had three sisters. Um, my grandmother became a widow in World War I, and she sent the two older ones, uh, who were then 16 and 18, to the land of opportunity, the golden land where you found gold in the street. So uh, those aunts I never met until I, I came to the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, they wound up working in sweatshops. Um, the younger two, my father and his younger sister, were too young, they stayed behind, and um, they established themselves. Um, they owned, um, as you told the audience, you saw the pictures. Um, we had a two-family house together, and together they were in the uh, business of selling native Ukrainian costumes, which my father had employed some people. He had weaving looms, mm -hmm. and they wove those, and my mother was in the store selling those dry goods, the costumes to the people, and uh, she had a nanny for me. And they also had somebody who came in to do laundry. Um, on my mother's side, she was the eldest. She had two other older, they were eight children, two had died before, and so she became the eldest. She was the only one, first one to be married. I had aunts that were only seven years older than I. Mm -hmm. um, they lived in a smaller town uh, where my grandfather owned an orchard, a dry goods store, had very good relationship with, with his Ukrainian um, neighbors. Uh, he would give them credit at Christmas time. Um, they were thrilled when we came to visit mm -hmm. and I was spoiled rotten. Um, but all that beautiful life, I had friends, I had played in the streets, I had a doll carriage. My grandma who lived with us, um, she, many people in our town spoke, the Jewish people spoke German to their children. And my grandmother, may she rest in peace, she insisted that I speak uh, Yiddish because before I was born, it was Austria-Hungary. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so thanks to her that I, my first language was Yiddish, and that's why I, I'm able to translate documents now. Um, so life was good. Uh, I had my, my cousin with, cousins with me to play with. Um, all of that lovely, <laughs> Uh, Utopia, so, so to speak, changed very rapidly. And, and before we talk about those changes, yes. a couple more questions for you. Tell us a little bit more about your father. Um, you said he was a, a very charitable, charitable man. Yes. Well, unfortunately, um, I didn't know him long. Right. I only knew him for four and a half years. Right. But um, some things I do remember. Mm -hmm. He. Um, was modern Orthodox and used to take me to um, synagogue. He had a lovely voice and he would uh, pray. And um, I remember him taking me and observe different holidays. And yes, he was um, a member of the burial society, very charitable, a very good person. And I heard more about him uh, to have a good name is more important than anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, later on, when I met people who knew we him, because yeah. unfortunately, he did not 
survive. And we'll, of course, talk about that yes. in a moment. Uh, tell us about your home. It was, it was, for the time, it was very modern, right? It was very modern, yeah. yes. Um, we, um, the reason being that I'm an only child was uh, we had a radio. We did have electricity. No um, bathroom facilities. I mean, we had bathroom, but uh, we had to get water from the well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, there were no washing machines or right. all of that. Um, but they heard Hitler's speeches were heard already the, the year I was born. And um, so as a result, they decided not to have any more children. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a good thing because I... I doubt if a younger child would have survived what I survived. Right. Uh, so in that sense, yes, it was modern. We, we lived a good life. Yeah. And of course, all that would change once the war came to your community. As we noted before, war began in September of 1939, but in, it was some months later that um, the, the Soviets occupied your town. Um, tell us and you were just four, not quite four years of age when that happened. You're now under Soviet control. What did that mean for you and your family once the Soviets were in your town uh, in Vashkovitz and took control of your lives? Well, it was pretty difficult. They uh, conscripted all the young men into their army. Uh, my father was one of them. For some reason, my uncle got out of it. Um, my father's... Um, brother-in-law, mm -hmm. but um, that was the last time, little did I know that I was to see him. He was on a train, he was, became a soldier, but at least I have the knowledge that he um, fought against the Nazis. He was in the Soviet army, mm -hmm. and I will tell you later how we found out right. do you, what happened to him. Do you know from your mother, once he went off and you took the train and he was gone, was she able to hear from him for any period of time? Did she get letters? Do you know? I really don't know. You don't know. Or I don't remember. Right, of Just course not. Going back. Of I mean, course not, yeah. I'm 82 now. To go back one year or four, it's a yeah, little no, difficult. But I do have fragmented pieces of memory here and there. How old was your father when he left, when he was drafted? He was in his early 30s. Early 30s. He was seven years older than my mom. Okay. <clears throat> so now with your father gone into the army, um, who was, how, did, how did you manage to make ends meet in the family? What happened with your father being gone? Well, we still had the store. Still there were the no store. restrictions yet. Um, but they do remember uh, one incident. My Father's, uh, my aunt had two children, one of whom was uh, six years older than I. Mm -hmm. And we had the Russian army, was, we lived on a main street, came marching. And my cousin being a curious little boy, he went up in, in the attic and he was looking out. And suddenly the march stopped and we heard banging on the door uh, with bayonets. Um, Everybody was very frightened. My mother told us, the girls, to go hide under the bed. And soldiers came marching and they said, there's a spy in the house. And she said, a spy in the house? What are you talking about? We saw somebody in the attic. And um, my cousin came down. And then my mother pleaded with them. She said, my husband is in your army. Please don't do us any harm because they were looking through the uh, closets and with bayonets. Looking and, for a spy. Yes, looking for a spy. And that little spy was my little cousin, who was only, you know, a little boy. Peering out the window seven, from the attic. Peering yeah. out the window, mm -hmm. yes. Um, so that gave us a taste of what was to come. Right, right. And who, who was living in the household with you at that time? Okay, there, we were two families. Two families. Uh, so two separate kitchens, of course. Um, my aunt, her husband, and two children, and her mother-in-law, mm -hmm. who was a widow as well. Um, my mother 
and I and my grandmother, my mm. father's mother, she was with us. She lived with us. She did. And, and what about your Aunt Bella? And oh yes, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that. My mother be, having been um, one of eight, and Bella was seven years younger than she, there was really no future for her in that small town that my grandparents lived in. So she, it was her luck that she came to live with us and find a position in a bank mm -hmm. uh, where she worked. And uh, that saved her life because when she wanted to go back home, there were trains were no longer going to that small town. Which turned out to be, as turned you said. Turned out to be her savior. Her saving yeah. grace, yep. All that changed even far more dramatically, of course, on June, in June of 1941, when Germany and its allies turned on the Soviet Union and Romanian troops, who were the allies of the Nazis, occupied your town. Tell us what the effects were immediately and then what happened once the Romanian troops, allies of the Nazis, were in control of Vashkovitz. It was very different. There were restrictions. We were not allowed to go out, only at certain times. Um, they, the Romanian soldiers wanted to show their power and the bank where my mother, where my uh, aunt Bella had worked in, um, they took 20 Jews out in the marketplace and they, they shot them just simply because they were Jews. They didn't commit any crime. Um, and one of the people that were shot was a friend of my, my aunt's. Of he Bellas. worked in the bank, mm -hmm. yes. So they wanted to show their strength that they were there. Mm -hmm. Do you, because you were so young, did you have any awareness of those kinds of things or did your well, mother shield you from that as much as possible. I suddenly saw sadness around me. Yeah. Um, we didn't know what would happen. And shortly after, uh, there was an edict. We were told, all the Jewish people of the town, you have to be ready, and 20, within 24 hours, you have to be ready to leave. And you can only take with you, whatever you can take with you is fine but everything else you have to leave behind. Well, think about it. What do you take? What's important? Um, and only 24 hours, not knowing where we were going. We did hear a rumor that we were supposed to be transported to a death camp, which was uh, Pretoria. Um, my grandmother uh, had some money sewn into her undergarment. Mm -hmm. And um, as a child, I said, why, why are you doing this, Grandma? And she said, you never know. Maybe it'll save our lives someday. Uh, my mother took some money and possessions and buried them in the attic, attic as well as uh, photo albums. That's why I do have photos. And many survivors say how lucky that you have some photos. I also have some photos that we used to send to America to, to my to aunts. The aunts and that were here. So, because my husband had no photo of his childhood, of him being a baby at all. So some of the photographs, the photographs we saw earlier, had been hidden in the attic. In the and attic. We were able to recover yes. them after the war. Yes. So, um, and it was true, the money that my grandmother had sewn in her undergarment did help. Well, within 24 hours, uh, my mother bundled me up in layers of clothing. As little as I was, um, I had a, a knapsack on my back right. with some possessions. Um, so it was literally whatever you could carry. Whatever we could carry. They could took carry. some bedding with them. My mother took some of my father's clothing and his prayer shawl with her. She said, if he returns, I want to have these things. We didn't know where we were going, what, what would happen. So it was a very, very difficult time. We were gathered. We were on these terrible trains, um, gathered in a big waiting hall. Um, 
I had an infection to begin with, an ear infection, and uh, it was very crowded, crying. And in the middle of the night, my uncle heard rumors. He heard that some Romanian soldiers would take bribes and uh, they would, instead of us going to death camps, they would take us on barges to uh, Transnistria, Transnistria, Shargarod, and um, it was, they had labor camps there and ghettos. So our chances for survival there were better. Than the other option, yes. absolutely. Yes, and yeah. so this is where my grandmother's money came, money right? came okay. in handy. And of course, we took our lives in our hands because we would have been shot on the spot. I don't know how, I don't have any recollection right. how we got out. And uh, there were barges and uh, soldiers were holding children and one soldier was holding me by the hand. At the time I was blonde and um, a soldier, very kind. There, there were some kind people around too. Uh, he looked at my mother's face and the anguished look on her face. She said, uh oh, he's gone because there were many children. Even though they took bribes, they drowned those children. They threw them in the river. And uh, he said, don't worry, I have a little child just like yours at home and I'm not going to harm her. So that was my first lucky, mm -hmm. lucky day too. So after I bribing, after bribing them and and they're they're honoring that, I guess is the right word. Yeah, and, so to speak. So yeah. to speak, and taking you across the river. So once you're across the river, you're in this village, this small place of Shargarod, and you would remain there for I think almost three years, living in this ghetto. Um, Although life was very hard there, you told me that you have some memories of, of both the good and the bad while, while you were there. Tell us about that three-year period of living in this little village. What was, what was waiting for you when you arrived? And then what were your circumstances like while you were living there? Okay, first of all, when we arrived, we were very fortunate that a family, a Jewish family, it was a ghetto where there were restrictions, of course. Right. Um, and they also took people out to labor camp, which two soldiers showed up and they took my aunt every day to labor camp. My mother was with me. That was my saving grace. I was never separated from my mother. This poor family of four. That lived in the house that you That are. lived in this clay hut, really. Clay hut. Okay. Primitive. Here we came from a modern home. Um, they had no electricity, no bathroom facilities. It was bitter cold there. They had a pail on the outside. Mm -hmm. They had a one bedroom pot belly stove that kept everybody warm while they did the cooking. And they took in nine people. There were 13 of us in this one bedroom clay hut. Where, where four people had lived. With four people that by the kindness of their heart, they took us in. Mm -hmm. um, my aunt and uncle, uh, my uncle had typhus then. It was very dangerous. There were no antibiotics or anything like right. that. There was starvation. My aunt, after she would come from labor camp, she had, uh, there was a black market though, and she used to knit beautifully and sew and would go to the black market so she could have some food on the table for us. We occasionally had potato and water. That was our, and in the morning, we had a piece of bread. Mm -hmm. Times were very hard, and my cousin was entering his teenage years, and my aunt would shout at him, why can't you be like others and steal, go, and he said, no, one of our commandments is thou shalt not steal. But it got so bad uh, that they decided to leave us and go to another camp. They went to another labor camp. They chose they were able to do that uh, because we would not have survived all 13 of us in, in that, those, in those conditions. conditions. Yeah. But as children, uh, what really kept us going too was cleanliness. Um, my mother had to walk 
I don't know, mile or whatever to a, a, a river where um, she washed her clothing and my cousin and I, they made us some kind of a rag doll as children. We still found some happiness and a little stone served as a ball. Um, we went to the river where they washed their clothes and uh, none of us knew how to swim. Mm -hmm. uh, suddenly my cousin said to my aunt, to my mother, uh, Aunt Tabel, there's a little girl in the water. And, well, it was I, I was drowning, I couldn't swim. Mm -hmm. So she, that was another time I almost lost my life. She threw a, uh, a sheet in the water and I hung onto it and, and pulled me out. But that was so traumatic for me, I could not speak for about three days, and uh, they did some witchcraft. Like the good witch came out of the West, and she said some, <clears throat> she broke some eggs, I remember that, um, raw eggs on my forehead, and she did an abracadabra or whatever, and it, she said, don't worry, she'll be talking in three days, and I did. And you did, you were so talking. So by a miracle, yeah, that was a good witch. Um, so, and there was a woman from the same town who decided she would form, she felt bad for the children, and she formed a little like pre-kindergarten class, and she would meet with us and teach us songs, and um, so I was thrilled when I was able to, she taught us a little bit of Hebrew also, um, was thrilled when I was able to say that I, had a piece of bread today with oil on it, mm -hmm. and shared that when we had show and tell. You um, you shared with me that one of your recollections is is really always being hungry. You remember that? Always being always being hungry. Always being hungry. Always being hungry. Yes. Yep. Starving. And my cousins in the United States, when we came here, they said it's because of you that we were chubby because they said you have to eat everything on your plate because your cousins are suffering mm -hmm. in, in Europe. They're starving. And in fact, people did starve to death. In oh, Chicago. yes. I saw that before my eyes. Yep. Starvation, uh, uh, that was a horrible, that memory will never leave me. When we saw dead bodies in the street and, and dogs frightened me, mm -hmm. especially German shepherds. To this day, right? To this day, my, my friends, when they invited us to dinner, they knew they had to put them in a kennel because I, I had that fear mm -hmm. of German shepherds because they would run after the Jews. Right. During that time in Chagarat, you also, I think, lost your grandmother. Yes, yeah. I was very close to my grandmother. Um, my grandmother was really a very strong woman when I think back. Um, she was not very old. She, here, she had two children in, in America and grandchildren whom she never met. Um, her only son was in the army. She didn't know if he'd get back and her daughter left for another labor camp. Mm -hmm. I, she had a cancer mm -hmm. um, and she had, uh, in the Jewish religion, we have to, white shrouds, we have to go you know, and also we have to have a, a um, bag of soil that was holy from the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. And she had those shrouds made. I mean, we were all in this one room. Right. And so I, I saw these white shrouds. I said, what is this? And she said, well, I am probably going to die soon. And this is what we wear. And this is a... The, soil from Israel. She had a little packet and um, I want you to light a candle for me. It was hard for a child, you know, it's, this, it's a grandmother that you love. And shortly after she did pass and we do have a um, ritual committee, they do ritual bathing, but there were no funerals. She's my only grandparent that does have a grave site, but I, I never wanted to go back there. Um, they came and prepared the body. It has to be holy and pur purified. I saw all of that. Um, but at that time, they didn't take children to a cemetery, or for some reason, they didn't allow it. So that was 
really very traumatic for mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. um, especially my, my father was one of those rich, on the ritual committee which right. had done that, and I always wanted to emulate him and do that one day. It's something, it's very holy, we don't talk about it uh, because we don't receive thanks and people are not supposed to know. It's like a secret society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's very holy work. Uh, so I saw that and said goodbye to my grandmother then. Uh, it was a difficult time. Rita, before we turn to liberation, when the Soviets came in, in the, in the short time that you've been able to talk about that, you've just very quickly covered a three-year period of life, which is a long time. Um, and, and so I know that we can't even begin to do justice as to what that time was really like for you. I do wanna go back to one comment you made a little while ago. I think you said that you, you know, had like a, a doll made of rags, and you, and and you, um, a stone was like a ball. Say a little bit more about that. As as a child, a little girl, uh, with a need to play, even under the tough circumstances, what do you recall of of kind of your life as a child in play in any way, shape, or form? Well. There was sadness around, but as children, you know, find playthings. Right. And I had my cousin, which was short-lived, um, kept myself occupied. Mm -hmm. um, you dream. I don't know how we survived that period. Right. Um, somehow we did. Played little games found, you know, as, as a child, you try to put the negative out. Mm -hmm. Just like the beginning, I was very hesitant to speak because I didn't have recollections of everything, just fragmented pieces of memory of what it was like. There was a lot of sadness, but um, I always found something positive, mm -hmm. and my mother always built me up she was talking about the future. Maybe we'll go home and maybe we'll see our family again. And that's what kept the flame. And, and it makes us, I think, really appreciate how important that informal school that you were able to go yes. to must have been in your life. That was that very period. important. Yeah, I can and friends are important. The Soviets returned to Shargarat in early 1944, only this time they're coming back as liberators. Tell us about the arrival of the Russians and what it meant for you and your family um, once, once they were back in. Uh, and for you, effectively, the war was over where you lived. Um, well, the front was coming close. You could okay. hear bombing. To this day, I, I hate noises, mm -hmm. except for fireworks. I'm a kid at heart, I love fireworks. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it was very, very concerning. In fact, it was so concerning that the owner of the, um, of the little primitive house, he had a friend who had a sub-basement. We didn't have any basement. So all of us went to the sub-basement uh, in hiding because- In the friend's house. In the friend's yeah. house. Uh, they allowed us in. And there was a teenage boy. The, the noise was really deafening, horrible. Uh, we knew that there was bombing all over. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't stand it any longer. He said, I have to get out. I have to see what's happening. Everybody was against it and discouraged him. But he said, no, no, I have to go out. He went out and he came back. And he was elated. He said, the war is over. And everybody looked at him in disbelief. It can't be. They thought he was hallucinating. Mm -hmm. um, he said, the war is finally over. Well, slowly but surely everybody went out and it really was over. We could not believe it. We were elated, but then again, where do we go? What next? We don't have a home. What next? How do we get home? There were no provisions, nothing, you know, 
was laid out for us. Right. And in part, the Soviets were just moving on to the next place. Yes, the, the they, were liberator. they were our liberators. But we were grateful on. for that. Yep. Uh, we were free to go. But where do we go? Yep. Of course, the first place you want to go is home. Mm -hmm. You want to see who survived and what was left of your home. Um, that journey was on different army transport. And my aunt, we went to uh, Chernovitz, which was a large town to where we used to live. Um, my aunt was a scout because she saw somebody from the hometown who had been um, a daughter of a, a priest. And there were righteous Gentiles too, thank God for that. Mm -hmm. I wish there were more, but they did a lot. They, they, um, really put their lives in danger for helping. And um, they scouted it out and he said, I'll get you to your house. Um, and he did, it took us a while. When we got to Vashkos, our home was occupied. The Iron Curtain started setting in, the Russians were there. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and they made a silo out of our house. It was no longer our house. My mother had to beg them to please let her in because she just wanted her photographs, mm -hmm. never mind the money. Right. Uh, it took a while to persuade them. She said my husband was in the army. Um, she, they did allow her to retrieve the photographs. Money was gone, but it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. Um, and we could not live in our house, but the uh, friend of my aunt's, they persuaded. We also had a, a great-grandparent's house, and it was occupied, but the soldier insisted that they take us in. There were three of us, my, my mother, my aunt, and myself to give us a room and stay there. In what had been your grandfather's house? What had house. been my grandparents' house. And you there were other occupants, and I remember Russian soldiers there for some reason. Mm -hmm. Because when I would come home from school, that was my first really introduction to a school. It was a Ukrainian school, very frightening for me. Um, a long way, the winters were bitter. We were indoctrinated to um, to love Stalin and his picture. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a good student, but still they didn't uh, celebrate Christmas as such, but they celebrated in January with a Christmas tree and they Father Christmas, mm -hmm. they called it. And I remember having to recite a, a Ukrainian poem there. Um, it's at that time also that we found out about my father, his best friend came home from, the, from serving in the army, and he gave us the exact date when he was killed fighting the Germans. He was killed in action against the Killed in Soviet. action. Um, my mother went back to the village where her parents lived, and um, the same neighbors that were my grandfather who was pious and kind, was kind to. They're the ones who turned, when the war was going on, turned on them, and with farm implements, they let my grandfather, who had a long beard, watch how they murdered his wife and his five children who were left behind. Because mm. So that was very, very difficult. Here my mother was in her 20s, finding out that she was, became a widow. Mm -hmm. um, her parents gone, her sisters and brother gone. Uh, it, it was sad and very difficult time, but she thanked God that I, I survived and mm -hmm. her one sister survived. Bella, Bella. The the date that your grandparents were murdered and um, the other family members, that was June 19th, is that right? Yes. June 19th, just yet, 79th anniversary yesterday, I think. Yes, that, yes. 
horrible. And that you mentioned to me before that that date always is a terrible time for you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So tell us a little bit about, um, uh, well, you reconnected with your aunt and uncle that had lived with you in the, in the little house in Shagarat, and they left, I think. Oh, yes. And, and did you... We reconnected. They, they, uh, they came back to the town, too, they miraculously. Came back, okay. uh, I don't know exactly where they lived. I couldn't remember that. Um, where they... <clears throat> when they had left. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, um, of course, my aunt started working in a bank again. Um, and we saw the handwriting on the wall because there was no future for us there. Mm -hmm. The Jew was still not, was hated there. Mm -hmm. We couldn't, this was not a home anymore. Um, so it was hard to get out, but we had falsified papers saying that we were uh, born in Poland. This was the underground. Jewish underground, I don't know how they obtained these papers, um, so that we wanted to get out. We stayed in, in our hometown for a year, and since there was no future there, and we knew that we had family in the United States, and there was some family in Israel, but Israel was not independent yet. Um, so with the false papers, we decided to make our journey to, we heard that there were displaced persons camps established mm -hmm. by the United States and the Hebrew Sheltering Society. Um, so that was our goal, to get there. Well, how do we get there? Um, we were on the train to leave. We had the false papers. Oh, and there was another righteous Gentile who was um, a guard at the train station these were not luxury trains. Uh, they were, for the most part, um, tr coal trains. We hopped on them illegally. And this was just shortly after the war ended. Shortly after the war ended. Yeah. It was just a year after. Yeah. And um, they wouldn't allow my aunt to leave. But finally, under persuasion, we were all on the train. About an hour before it left, my aunt came. And that was my mother's only surviving sister. And we left. So it's the three of you? Just the three Just of the us three of and also my aunt and uncle and, and their family. And their family came yeah. too. And uh, the soldier did not betray us. His mother used to be a midwife to my grandmother and helped deliver the children. Mm -hmm. So there too was another time we were saved. Uh, the journey was very long. Um, we... Um, had to cross different borders. It took us three months. It's not three very... Three months. Yeah, Romania is not very far from Germany um, to make the journey and uh, go at night. We got on different trains. We posed as Greeks, all kinds of borders. It was, uh, we were in the Czech, Czechoslovakia and we were in Poland. But this was all done at night mm -hmm. in secret. That's where my aunt met her future husband also. He was from Lithuania, and he lost his entire family in Auschwitz. Um, it took us three months. Bella met him on the journey? Yes, the she journey. met him on the journey. So you finally eventually make it to... Uh, we finally made it to Germany. To Germany. Germany that was guilty of all that happened to us where I lost really essentially my childhood. But it was DP camps, displaced persons camp, and we were displaced from our homes. And um, we finally felt freedom, even though we were in the same barracks where the SS soldiers were trained. Uh, we were given a room, but we had the freedom. We had schools. Schools were established. Trade schools were established. Theater. Trade. Uh, all life was reborn. Right. There were many weddings. And one uh, DP camp, there were 2,000 babies born because parents lost their children. Children lost their parents. Right. I met um, friends who did not know a word of Yiddish. 
How do we communicate? They were hidden by Polish people. They were hidden in convents, mm -hmm. and they only spoke Polish, so I was forced to learn Polish. Um, believe it or not, those of you who are school children, you say, oh, school, I can't wait till it's over. We loved it. We finally, we were like sponges. We had history and mathematics and science, all the subjects that we, we missed. We had all this loss. Well, as you said, sort of life was reborn. Life was absolutely reborn. In fact, um, General Eisen, he was the general then. He right. became President Eisenhower. He came to our camp. Um, <clears throat> and my friend who played the piano, she played for him. As a result of the war, though, a lot of our children were sick. And um, we contacted TB, tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. um, this was shortly after the war. I had TB. It was discovered. They didn't tell my mother right away, but I was sent to a sanitarium, which was about an hour away from the camp. I was uh, nine at the time, nine, ten years old. Um, and that would have been the first time you were separated from your mother. Yes, it was the first time. Um, and um, the sanitarium had a lot of anti-Semitic nurses in it. Mm -hmm. It was a difficult time. I think my, my pain tolerance comes from that period. Mm -hmm. My mother left me uh, with other children who had TB, but when she came back a week later, she could only afford to come once a week, um, she did not find me. And they said, oh, she's in quarantine. Cause I, and I had to be there for nine months. They could not give me um, streptomycin. I needed streptomycin shots. <clears throat> because they only gave it to patients who had uh, TB of the bones. Um, but luckily, we had family, so my mother, we got in touch with family. In the United States, in right? In the United States. However, they had to perform other tests on me, and I was in surgery where they had to collapse a lung. I was there for nine months. Nine months. It was very nine difficult. Months. Difficult nine months, but was your, was your mother able to come and visit you during that time? Once, once a month, once a week she came. Once a week, and um, I used to console her. I see birds now, and don't worry, I'll be fine. And there was one Danish doc, and the nurses um, were not very nice. They said they'll do all kinds of tests, they'll hurt, and I gritted my teeth and I said, no, I'm not going to cry. I'll just show them. Um, but I survived it, and uh, the, and the can in schools, they took us on different trips. We went to different castles. As far as food, we had provisions that they sent, gave us cans. We didn't know about tuna and cans and spam. We, we wouldn't touch spam, so my stepfather would go to the farm stand, farmers and he would give them the spam and canned goods and in turn they gave us chickens, fresh chickens. And, in return uh, for cans of spam. Right, yeah. and we had, <laughs> we had packages that came from the United States, yeah. uh, hand-me-downs from my cousins and uh, we went to the woods and we would steal apples from the orchards. It, it was wonderful for us kids. It was really life reborn. And you were there um, almost, what, three years? Three years. Three we years. had to wait for a quota system. Okay. Um, and while we were there, um, I will never forget one day in particular. It was, um, it will always be in my mind and my heart, May the 18th, 1948, mm -hmm. when Israel was declared an independent country. We finally had a country to go to. And the United States, of course, Truman was the first to sign. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was such joy in the school and in the camp. The kids, there were a handful, there were about a hundred of us who made a bonfire and we danced around all night long because we no longer had to say, tell me, where shall I go? Every door is close to me. We finally had a place to go to. Mm -hmm. But of course, I was too young. I couldn't make this. My aunt, who married <clears throat> my uncle, had a quota system. They left for the United States way before we did. They left uh, in 40s, and Bella, 40, and Bella left in 47, oh. right? And 
I had two aunts whom I never met, my father's sisters. I wanted to go to Israel because it was our, finally our country. My mother said, I'm sorry, but you're too young. I wanted to be on the Exodus. You're coming with me. We're going to go to the United States. I mean, it's, it was a wonderful decision. Right. But um, so that was a date that I will never forget. And another thing in camp, we had um, a lot of plays uh, that I participated in. And my mother, I love to sing, just like my father, I guess I inherited mm -hmm. it. That's why I formed that group. Um, and while I was on stage, there was a mother sitting next to my mother, a, a woman, not a mother, she was a mother. And she said, I wonder if that little girl's mother is alive to see her on stage. And my mother said, yes, I'm lucky. This is my daughter. And she said, you are very lucky because I lost a child her age in the war. There were many such horrible stories. And I met many of my friends in school who lost their parents. Um, but thank God, you know, we, we were finally free and we got the help we needed. And um, with the quota system, we were a little afraid because unlike, they didn't have Ellis, they, Ellis Island existed, but we had to have medical exams before we came into the United States. So we so were afraid. So instead of being quarantined right. in Ellis Island, you exactly. had to right there. Well, so we were afraid because with my history of TB that we would not be allowed right. in. Right. But finally, in 1949, you made it here. Oh, my, yes. Yep. Before, before um, we start to close the program, I want to ask you about a couple of other things, if I can, Rita. You, you, you said to me that your mother uh, was a survivor and a very strong lady, which is evident from what you've told us. But tell us a little bit more about your mom. Well, she was very strong. She did her best to try to put food on the table. She and my aunt, uh, my father's sister, they would really go to places that were illegal to try to make it. Um, she amazingly uh, had my father's prayer shawl. How she saved it, I don't know, but that's the only thing I have left of him. And um, to this day, my, my late husband used to wear it on high holidays. Mm -hmm. And um, I do so too, and it's, it has been present at every one of my mm -hmm. grandchildren's B'nai Mitzvah. Um, I feel very close to him. That's the only thing that I have of him. Be before you open it, which I hope you're going yes, to I'm do. Yes, I'm not going to do that yet, but I want to relate my feeling yeah. when I first came to the United States. And, and, and I just wanted to sort of reiterate for our audience, think of the journey that this took. Oh my. That your mom hung on to this through all that you've described to us, going across the river in the barge, getting, staying in that little home in Shargarat for three years, hanging on to this. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's unbelievable, really. Absolutely. That she was able to save this. Mm -hmm. um, the museum wanted it, but I said, no, this belongs to my family, mm -hmm. and hopefully, you know, it'll be present at weddings like it was at, at Bar Mitzvahs. But I just want to relate my wonderful experience as a United States citizen and my coming on the ship. It was not a cruise ship, believe me. It was an army transport. It happened to be the same army transport that my husband took that General Han when he was drafted too young, because his parents wrote him four years younger, he was 16, he was drafted in the army, they were here a short time. And he was on that same ship that they- As a troop to to, transport. Yes, to Germany, as we were coming here. Wow. It was a terrible journey to this day. I only went on one cruise, because I still remember the journey. We were in bunk beds right near the machinery, and uh, my mother and I were very sick. But the day we landed in New York Harbor, um, we finally got on deck. That's when our illness left us. We couldn't eat a thing. And seeing the Statue of Liberty greeting us, it was there I finally felt I am free at last, mm -hmm. free to practice my religion. 
the doors were open and the opportunity. We came with nothing. We had no money left, nothing. It's really a wonderful country. It's a land of opportunity. We can criticize, but we have the freedom to criticize. Uh, since we had nothing, I, I qualified to welfare, but no, we would not do that. My mother tried to work and my stepfather, and I made it a few really pursue things and work hard, you can make it. I went to school at night, worked during the day, became a teacher, and my husband and I were the first in the family to own our own home and a car, and our parents were very, his parents, he was lucky they survived. And my mother, we were very proud, and uh, thanks to the United States, I really am so grateful and this is still the best country. We have leaders that are good, leaders that are not so good, but I think it should be open to immigrants because immigrants add so much to this country, and, but they should be legal. I do believe in that. We waited for a quota system, mm -hmm. but it is one of the greatest countries in the world. Well, we're sure glad you're here. I am glad to yeah. be here. Rita, I'm going to um, uh, close the program in just a moment, and we're going to hear from Rita again to close our program. Um, I want to thank all of you for being with us today. We will have first-person programs each Wednesday and Thursday until August 8th. All of our programs um, are available uh, on the museum's YouTube page, so if you can't come back and join us, you can see Rita's program as well as all of our other programs. Um, because we didn't have a chance for you to ask Rita a question today, um, Rita's going to remain behind on stage when she's done, and so we would invite any of you, all of you, if you want, to come up on stage afterwards and meet Rita, ask her a question, um, you know, give her a hug, take a photograph with her, whatever you want to do. You're okay with that? Absolutely. So we, we do invite you to come up and do that very much. Um, it's our tradition at first person that our first person gets the last word. And so with that, I'm going to turn to Rita to, to close our program, All right. if All you right. want. Or. Okay. Oh, let me get you the mic. Oh. Re it's Rita. I just, Oops. I just disconnected <laughs> myself. I think, I think why, don't we, why don't you stay in the chair here, if you don't mind. I want to make sure it's video. It's so. Okay. Why don't you stay with us here? Oh, thank okay. you. Okay. But before I, my concluding remarks, I do want to say Hitler wanted to eradicate us from this earth. And I always say my revenge to Hitler is that I have three daughters, eight grandchildren, and hopefully there'll be other generations. So he did not succeed, and it's very important for each and every one of us to speak up when you see bullying. There's still so many small, not small, tragedies that are happening in Syria all over the world. And each one of us can really make a difference. Um, I want to say that I thank God that we survived really the darkest periods in history. I'm grateful to the United States for opening its doors to us. It's, as I said, the greatest country. We should appreciate the freedoms that we have and opportunities. And I'm proud to be a US citizen. I'm very patriotic. I always fly my flag. And I'd like to thank our men and women in the military for the sacrifices that they have made in protecting our freedom. And they're still doing it now. And hate is, is never right. And love is never wrong. Um, you young people, you people are our future, and that's why I, I feel it obligated to tell my story, and you can prove the deniers wrong that you did meet a survivor. There are many different stories. We all have different stories. Uh, my good luck was not having been separated from my mother, and um, how do I believe? I still do believe in God. Why did I survive? Sometimes you feel guilty. Why did I survive? Why didn't others survive? There must be an answer somewhere. And uh, if you save one life, we say it's as, as though you saved really the world. Um, and I'm, I'm dedicating this in 
this presentation in memory of, of course, my loved ones and the one and a half million children and the six million and those others, 11 million people that died in a terrible, terrible period. Um, I thank you for listening to my story. I hope you'll pass it on. And uh, what makes me feel good and go on at my positive attitude I, makes me feel good if I help people. That's why I, I volunteer. I like working with children, always have loved children because I lost a childhood. And you children are our future. So I know there's a lot of sadness in this world, a lot of bullying. Please stand up for what's right. And that's very, very important. Do the right thing. Thank you.